Welcome to Aerospace Structures 1. Today we will be covering the considerations in the design of aerospace structures. To go through this material, I have invited a special guest, Chad Foster, and we'll be having a conversation with him about the, about the design, analysis, testing, and inspections. And also, we're going to be discussing how personalities can play a critical role in being an integral part of the team. We are first going to have a conversation uh, with a special invited, invited guest lecturer, Chad Forster, who is the chief engineer at Virgin Orbit. And what we're trying to achieve in this course is we're trying to understand the failure modes and loading conditions that spacecraft parts will experience and understand how these spacecraft parts will fail in service. Um, so, as a consequence, uh, I first want to invite our guest speaker, for him to give us his 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 point of view on the types of failure modes we should be looking for, his experiences in general. And so to introduce him, let me explain who he is. Chad Forster is a former colleague who is now the chief engineer at Launcher One Evolution at Virgin Orbit. In his current position, he's the technical lead for Launcher One development program uh, that will take the launch system past its initial configuration to both increase performance market capture and improve manufacturability and cost. Chad has been with Virgin Orbit since 2015, developing Launcher One, a liquid air launch all composite rocket that utilizes a Boeing 747 as its carrier aircraft and a mobile ground segment. Previously at Virgin Orbit, he led the second stage structures and separation mechanisms team. And prior to Virgin Orbit, he was a member of the technical staff in the structures department at the Aerospace Corporation, working a variety of satellite and launch vehicle system. His work experience also includes a stint at Honeywell International in the automotive and aerospace business units during turbo machinery and design, testing and simulation. He received his BS in engineering from Harvey Mudd College and an MS in structural engineering from the University of California, San Diego. And a good overview of, you know, what we're, what market we're capturing or trying, trying to capture uh, the small sat market, which is fundamentally different than a, the big rocket uh, market for the geosats that a SpaceX or ULA or um, Ariane Spas works in. So this next video is an, a quick overview of the launch demo that we conducted uh, this last May. And then we can jump into, you know, the question and answer session. And after uh, I can give a brief, uh, a little bit more expansive than what Vinay did in the introduction, uh, overview of my kind of background and uh, experiences. So our team got to the launch site very early in the morning. We prepared our rocket, we prepared our airplane, we went through our checks of our mission control center, and we got into our operations. The launch team then walked out and checked out the ground equipment and we flowed propellant into the rocket. We verified that everything was healthy and then we disconnected it. And our flight crew boarded the airplane and taxied out and took off from Mojave Air and Spaceport. We climbed to uh, first 10,000 feet, did our initial checkout, and then went up to our flight altitude of 35,000 feet, entered a racetrack pattern. The system then moved automatically through pressurizing our, our propellant tanks, activating our systems. The pilots then pulled up the 747 and dropped the rocket off the airplane. The rocket then went into a control mode. As it moved through the atmosphere, we ignited the first stage. We then guided the rocket to its trajectory. And at that point, we did have an issue uh, in the system and the engine shut down. Clearly, some disappointment that we, we didn't get to finish the flight and, and take it to orbit, but we were all prepared for that. We collected an enormous amount of data, verifying air launch, separation of the rocket, control of the rocket. We've got an enormous amount of data about the aerodynamics in free space, in powered flight, and we verified our controls algorithms as we guided the rocket with our first stage engine. 
Our engineers are pouring through the data now. We'll be applying lessons learned to our next rocket, which is right here in the factory for being prepared. We'll make whatever modifications we need to, and we'll get to the next flight. So I'll just start with a, a, let's give myself three minutes for a more um, extensive introduction, and then we can go through the questions you have outlined here, Vinay. So like Vinay said, I joined in 2015. Uh, my current, the current company I work for is Virgin Orbit. Those are the two videos that you saw. Uh, the second video narrated by our CEO is the launch demo that we went through earlier this year. You know, that's the culmination of years of effort. And it is something that is more complex, I would say, than a ground launch system because you have the carrier aircraft element, which we had to modify a 747 and develop a release mechanism and do a flight test program all just for that without even taking into consideration the rocket. And then we have to push the two systems together with the rocket and the aircraft. And that's essentially what we did in 2018 and 19. And we dropped an inert rocket in the summer of 2019. And then we put on a fully live rocket and that's with all the cryogenic propellants. And that's what we recently did. So that's years of work, you know, going from a concept all the way to a demonstration of a system where you have three main components coming together, you know, a carrier aircraft, a ground segment, and that's the mobile ground segment I talk about. Um, and you saw in the video and also a air launch, liquid air launch rocket of orbital class, which is actually, you know, the first in the world, the X-15, which is something that's similar, you know, was not orbital, it was suborbital. And so it's a new tech and we have a lot of composites on it. So there's a lot of, you know, new stuff happening together on this program. And that's kind of, you know, what I wanted to highlight. And, you know, as far as my, my background here, you know, as a engineer, I came in here as a mechanical engineer to contribute as an individual contributor. And I gradually, you know, rose up as leading groups and eventually the second stage structures and mechanisms teams. So basically all the separation events on the vehicle, stage separation, fairing separation, and all the structures, primary and secondary from stage step onward. So second stage, payload area, fairing. And that really, you know, gave me a lot of background into the top level design trades, you know, down into the nitty gritty, you know, choosing bolts and choosing resin systems and all that. Um, so that's my experience here. And, and I, in my past experience, like Vinay said, I was working with at Aerospace Corporation with Vinay, and Vinay has taught me a ton about uh, spacecraft structures and launch vehicle structures and thermomechanical loading and, you know, some fancier carbon-carbon uh, structures in the composite world. You know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of meat, you know, in composites uh, throughout design, analysis, testing, you know, that you can spend your life you know, learning or focusing on just one. And so that, I really learned uh, a lot from Vinay and, and, you know, want to thank him for inviting me here to speak to you guys to give an overview of my experience and, and also provide some, I guess, uh, knowledge, knowledge uh, points that might help you in choosing your first career or your first job or helping you as you guide yourself through your first, you know, through years of the career. And as you can see from the picture, you know, this, the, the career is not uh, without stress. Um, the, the two pictures, one is actually uh, nine years ago when I, when I joined Aerospace Corporation and, and the, the other one is uh, me today. So obviously this job does age you, but it's a lot of fun. And it, uh, it really pushes you, you know, to know really and understand your limits. So now we can get into uh, Vinay's more boilerplate, boilerplate questions and get those answered. You want to step into those, Vinay? Yeah, Chad, thanks for the introduction. Um, and, you know, uh, there's an ext extensive experience. Could you tell us a little bit about uh, what are the top tangible lessons learned that you, you found relative to technical findings in the areas of test analysis and in the. So we'll focus on, I'll, I'll do a, just 
going through design analysis, um, uh, testing and and i I'll kind of go in that order. Um, you know, one of the things on, on design, I will say is designing is all about, uh, iterating. It's not about like choosing the, the most optimal thing first. It's really, I would say a very, a, a team, an engaged team activity. And that's how I approached it with uh, the team I was working with. And that could be a team that you have within a company. It also could be a team that you have with external players that are at a vendor or vendor and maybe another external agency like a technical expert, um, a place where you have technical experts like Aerospace Corporation or uh, NASA. And so like that's on design, like design is a very, you, you want to embrace the iterative aspect of it. There is frustration associated with that in terms of lost work and you know paths that end up in dead ends but you really do want to explore the space you know when you're in that initial design and that's what we did on this program you know and that can be from the fasteners you end up choosing you know to the resin system you have on the composite or the application of um you know balanced versus unbalanced laminate layups you know, you, you want to look at them all when you're in an initial kind of concepting phase and be comfortable with that. And that's frustrating for some people. It's really fun for other people. And um, you want to balance all those kind of that, that, that energy in the design phase. So that's design. Uh, for, the, for the analysis side, uh, there's, there's so many pitfalls in analysis uh, that you can name and they're, they're all out there. You know, Vinay's talked to you about them. Uh, the, the one, the one thing I can say, you know, in addition to all the model checks you end up doing with uh, final modeling, and uh, there, well, there's two things. One is make sure there's an analytical basis that matches, you know, to, within within uh, reason your, your your numerical simulation, your final model. If you can't, if you can't do that, you need to be very careful with what you're doing. If you don't have a really good uh, analytical way to kind of capture what you expect to see with an analysis, then on the an FEM side, you have to be extra careful. And so on the FEM side, I would say that things nipped me in the butt the most over the course of my career is usually boundary conditions. You know, making sure the boundary conditions are exactly how they're going to be representative in a, in a flight configuration or a test configuration. And that's boundary conditions for like displacement, rotation, but also thermal boundary conditions. And, you know, that, that, that involves maybe looking at, you know, doing a bounding analysis, but also maybe doing a couple different time consistent analysis points, you know, to do spot checks because you might have, you know, little minimums that coincide over the course of a, I would say um, a load of a loading event, a combined loading event. So the boundary conditions are huge. And I, I really, you always want to triple check those and then also have someone else triple check them. Uh, and hopefully they're independent and they didn't build the model. You know, so final models are a huge trap. They're very powerful, but they're a huge trap. And it'll lull you into a sense of um, complacency until you get into you know, your next big thing, which is, which is testing. And then for, for testing, uh, you know, I hear it here at Virgin, you know, we believe big in testing. And I would say for any composite primary structure, you always want to have it go through a test, you know, a dedicated qualification test and then an acceptance test as well for your, your flight articles. I think that's, you know, pretty standard for aerospace in terms of, uh, you know, guidance. But even in that, you know, there's a lot of uh, wiggle room and tailoring that happens. You, but you're not the actual like test engineer or test technician that tests it. It's super important for any person that's designed an article to be there while it's being tested. There are insights that you will have 
to help out the test configuration. That could be being a strain gauge or uh, making a call on the sensitivity of a uh, of an LVDT, you know, for measuring position. And also, you will learn. I would say the constraints that testing the the physical constraints or maybe it's the the software constraints that the testing program or testing shop or testing group within your company has and so like testing is all it's a very it's again it's a very it's a collaborative thing and really as a designer and analyst either one right because you could be the designer and you kick it over to analyst and then it gets built and then tested as a designer or analyst you want to be there for the testing especially the initial testing and the qualification testing to really understand what you produced and that will help you in any future future iterations that you do down the road so the last thing is uh ndt non-destructive testing or uh ndi non-destructive inspection i mean used throughout industry there's uh, techniques used on metallics and composites you know, some they used on, on both that are similar. I would say for a composite program, we are a co composite rocket. You can see that in the videos, you know, that were shown uh, just earlier. You, you can't replace NDT and it's something that you always have to work on in terms of refining your standards and dealing with anomalous situations that you find, you know, in builds and making judgment calls on whether to rebuild something or repair something or uh, do repair and also do a modified test, you know, to specifically address uh, some stress concentrations, maybe in a localized area that you repaired. You know, there's all these calls that you make based on NDT and some of them are not clear and that's, that's a frustrating experience. Uh, but I will say what you want to do in that situation is really rely on expertise there there's there's rated technicians and ndt and you want to also do your own homework and make sure you're really aware of the limitations and the grounding of any any team methodology that get used you know some i was lucky in that here at virgin orbit you know i've been here since the beginning and seen our ndt develop so you know that's kind of ingrained in me whereas if you go to a bigger corporation like boeing or lockheed they have a lot of the techniques and they have it all developed in their standards and they have reference coupons that they made maybe 20 or 30 years ago if you go there and you're relying on ndt or you're making calls on ndt make sure you really understand the underpinning data and standards and that's specifically like coupons that are that are the basis behind the decisions that you're making as an engineer. It's super important, it, it, especially in structures that end up being you know, near people and uh, that are safety critical. You, know, you don't wanna make the wrong call and you know, a little crack, especially in composite structures, can turn into a big issue if you get an, you know, a, a loading event that's right kind of at the edge of your, your boundaries, you know, one of your high loading events. So that's a, a long-winded answer to your first question, Vinay. So hopefully the next question I can answer shorter. Uh, no, go ahead, Chad. Be as uh, comprehensive as you can. But you know, why is test analysis and inspection so important? What, why we should be paying attention to analysis just like we should pay attention to test? Just, you know, why? Why are all these things important? Well, it's like the, it's a full life cycle of a, a product. And with an aerospace product that you see here, specifically our rocket, since we have it in the loop, essentially with humans on a 747 that's being piloted by humans, we have launch engineers on board. You know, you have to be extra careful. And so it's, um, Yeah, sorry, it said analysis, test, and what was the third one, Vinay? Uh, inspections. Oh, inspections, inspections, yes. You, you really, like, it's like a, it's like a stool, right? You know, a three-legged stool is, is fine. Those are the three legs that you could stand on and say something is safe or something will work, right? Even if you have a ground launch rocket that's not, doesn't have human exposure like we do with our rocket, 
you know, you want to make sure that the rocket works. It's millions of dollars. It's on your side in terms of hardware. It's uh, millions maybe or hundreds of thousands of dollars in operations costs. And it's also millions of dollars on your customer side, you know, of payload. And so there's, there's this huge, like, there's a risk aspect to it. And in order to provide, you know, the most kind of mission or mission assurance and reducing your, your mission, mission risk, and your safety risk, you really need three legs of the stool. And those are those three legs. They all look at the problem from a different viewpoint, right? You can have two of those and be really blind on the analysis and then one day have a bad day, right? Because you really didn't look uh, discreetly at, you know, the, the nominal case and the dispersions around the nominal case and really think critically about it, right? And the same thing goes with, you can only have analysis and inspections and you will also never, you know, get to test your article and really truly certify that you've met those safety factors that are, that are in a standard, you know, in a qual test or even, even an ATP test. And so the last thing is inspections, right? Inspections is something that, there is a lot of judgment there and there's uh it's a very i would say labor intensive process on the aerospace systems you know that could be for a satellite that could be for a launch vehicle that could that could be for a space plane or you know like like the shuttle um it's something that you really need expertise you need time and you need a lot of critical thought as well. So all of those involve critical thought, right? You know, testing, what does the test really give you? You know, what are you actually getting? Analysis is very like cerebral and ins inspections is very cerebral, like during the event and after the event. And it's very collaborative too. Um, if you are missing any of those two, you're, you're just running, you're running your risk. You're, 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 you're running at a different risk level. And, and that risk could be a partial mission failure. That could be a full mission failure, or that could be something that actually is catastrophic and and takes down the system or takes down a program, right? And that's kind of the, that's the reason you do all three in aerospace programs. And, and that's out of decades of learning, right? There have been attempts at shortcutting programs by cutting out one of those for cost or for time. And usually in the end, you end up doing some amount for that third leg that you're missing to kind of keep those systems running and operational. But the best thing you can do for a program is establish that solid foundation early and that expectation that you're going to do all three and have all of your engineers think about all three, even if they're not involved with all three. And that might be, here it's easier because we can have the engineer who designed it also be at the test and also be at the hammerhead up in Mojave after, you know, after we do a, a checkout test to go do a walk down of the vehicle to look for FOD, to look for loose fasteners, look for torque stripe issues, you know, all these like normal things that you do or look for, you know, uh, cosmetic blemishes or, or, indi you know, indications of any uh, FOD impacts on the vehicle. Like we can have the same engineer do that at a, at a larger corporation it's usually not as possible but that doesn't mean you can't ask the right questions request the right data and be involved in the process all right i think i'm done with yeah that. Th thank you chad you know what are some lessons learned uh, you can tell us about relative to soft skills for example uh, which may not be technical but they're more focused at the personality level Oh yeah. So the personality, uh, this is something that I I've always thought about and, and, uh, leading a team here has helped me refine, but, um, across the aerospace industry, really across any industry, uh, there there's, you're going to find a variety of personalities. Engineers tend to have a couple different kind of bucketed personalities or, or types of engineer. I would say an engineering personality. It doesn't mean about their, regular personality it's just their kind of engineering personality and i think that leads into another question you have down the road about the types of engineers and so i'll just kind of i'll talk about it at the same time 
you know, I look at engineers as, uh, you know, four fundamental types. You have an, an analyst approach, right? That might be your primary skill and kind of your primary mode of operation. Uh, you have the designers, you have uh, the pol politicians, and you have what I call the hustlers. And usually those are the people on the floor, you know, doing the work, turning the wrenches. They're down there with the technicians. That's really what they want to do. That's kind of their home base, right? And so those are the four kind of fundamental types of engineers. And within those types, you have personalities. You know, uh, some people are more open to collaboration. Some people are not. Uh, some people um, are, are good at, like, their personality just lends them to being good at flexing their communication style up and down the chain. So flexing uh, down to, you know, people that maybe new new engineers to help them out or, or uh, you know, flexing to a different area, like down on the manufacturing floor and talking with a technician or talking with the CEO. And the that's that's a that's a communication i would say style that's a kind of the more in-person communication and the other the other kind of uh personality trait i see and then some people are really good at that so these are the kind of the teacher teachers they are really good at consolidating information and presenting it in a concise way across you know any audience and so what I, what i've seen is you know, across those four engineering personalities that I just see, I just mentioned, you know, some people embody, there's not a correlation I've seen, at least that people embody these other skills of the in-person communication, the kind of like text communication. And, um, but you really want the diversity on your team across the whole spectrum in order to be successful. And if you have a team that, is too lopsided in one of those kind of nodes of, of engineering personality, you, you end up being blinded. It's the same thing as like, uh, you know, your stool, you're missing your legs of the stool. In a team, you want that diversity from an engineering side to really make sure you're ending up with a product that's gonna be meeting your requirements, meeting your market, uh, meeting the expectations. If you have a system, right, and you have, you have a subsystem you need to plug in together at the same time, time and have something work at the end you know the diversity is going to help you and so i think for young engineers you know people in school you really want to identify what engineering personality you are and um, sometimes it's easy sometimes it's not some people are maybe chameleons and they can do any of them or some people maybe have like two modes that they really are are good at that might be their dominant two hands and then they have their you know, non-dominant two hands. You really want to identify what are your dominant and what are your non-dominant and really work on your non-dominant and make sure you're well-rounded because that, that's going to provide you the most opportunities for success, for advancement, and for really bringing in the diversity that you need on a team. In order to engage a team member that might be a designer and you're an analyst, you really have to uh, bring your empathy and understanding of their perspective of, you know, doing a layout first and doing volume allocation and not, not going too fast into, you know, doing a bolt to joint analysis and doing a FEM, you know, stick in that sense, the designer wants to pull the analyst in a way and say like, what can you do with some really simple analytical equations to help us, mature the design as fast as possible. And then we're gonna get to a state and I'm gonna send it over to you, you know, while you're doing the FEM and you're gonna really tell me like how many bolts I really need at this interface and what, what, what is the real, you know, bolt material and the diameter and the type of washers we need to use, the locking features. And then the designer will take it back. And so there's this constant like throwing around of a ball and that's why you really wanna know what you are. And uh, that can be, you know, hopefully done over the course of your undergraduate or graduate, graduate career. And so for me, personally, um, I've always gravitated towards like being the politician side, I would say a politician and a designer, are my two, my two dominant 
And I've learned a lot on the analyst analysis side, and a lot of it comes from learning from Vinay and and doing my own work here. And I love working on the floor with technicians and stuff, but I always gravitate back towards kind of the politician side and the design side. Uh, yeah, Chad. So, what makes an engineer successful, in your opinion? Um, I would say uh, there's three things. I already mentioned one of them. Understanding your personality and flexing into other people's engineering, you know, personalities to bring them in. That's that's one of them. The other one is uh, being willing to be willing to fail, and sometimes it's hard. It's a hard fail, and that that could that could mean a couple different things, right? It could mean that you're taking a new position that you you feel like you're only fifty percent ready for, and that's what I've always done in my career. And uh, if I reach that threshold and I see an opportunity, I I look at it and I talk with people about it. And if I, if I feel comfortable, I, I get it. I, I, I apply for it and I, I go for it. And if I get it, you know, I should be ready to fail, right? That's a, that's a failing grade right off the bat. And th that really puts you in a place where you're constantly learning because you're, you're kind of catching up. You want to get to that place where you're getting a passing grade. And then you want to get to the place where you're performing and contributing and then you want to get a place where you're mastering it, right? And if you go through that progression in your career, and you're not just jumping from the same thing to the same thing, or the same scope to the same scope, you you'll 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 feel a little more. I, I feel uh, uh, fed in terms of getting new projects and feeding your brain, and you will be successful as well at the same time. And let's see, the, the last thing for being, you know, a successful engineer, I talked about the personalities. I talked about uh, being ready to fail. Um, engineering is, is not, it's not without stress. It's a, uh, but you have to, have to have a positive outlook and look for opportunities, right? If you, if you don't have a positive outlook, that you can get through that next milestone, right? You're going to end up shutting yourself down or shutting other people in a team down. And so that positive energy and looking for opportunities, even if like what you're throwing at the wall as solutions is not working or, or failing is, is a huge part of being successful in engineering. And even at the program like this, you know, we went through a lot of iterations on stuff, stuff that did not work. And, you know, we have, the, I would say, you know, dead hardware to show for it. I mean, that's no different than any other aerospace company. I mean, some of the stuff that you do as an aerospace engineer is difficult. It's never been done before, or it hasn't been done in a long time. So there really isn't not a lot of background knowledge to go on. So you're, you're flying blind until you get that first data point from a test. So yeah, you, you have to look at for the optimistic side of anything and you know lemon lemonade out of lemons i mean that's that is a, a central pillar of being a successful engineer because it's gonna it's gonna be stressful it's gonna be hard at points and look like you don't have a way out and uh you're just gonna have to work with your team and and find it that's very good chad um now I like it to describe different personalities types, you know, for both engineering and personality based because we have seen how personalities can really result in a solution maybe, how or the whole thing becomes a failure. And that's because of different personality types not working well together or working well together. So I'll let you get, get your thoughts on that if it's possible. Yeah, so I mentioned the three kind of engineering personality types um you know where i've seen and I'll, I'll kind of go with like the a generics on each one where i've seen stuff not work because it's biased you know to that personality type you know analysis that's an easy one 
you know, talk, people talk about analysis paralysis. Uh, the other thing with analysts I've seen too is they, uh, they see a solution elsewhere that's a kind of a design, a design based solution and they try to reapply it without really um, using their intuition. And it's something that like analysts sometimes don't have is they don't, they don't have like a design intuition on what will work and what will not work. What has a high chance of working and what has a high chance of not working. So they end up going down rabbit holes sometimes where like an instinctive designer would not go down that and they would totally re vector. So that's, that's the interesting thing about analysts. Um, analysts are, uh, can also be more, resistant to change and they, they, they I would say get more, probably the most upset about lost work. And so if you are an analyst, that's okay, man, you can provide a lot of value, but you know, in those situations where you, you've done something, you've been working on something for three months, you're like, we're not doing that anymore. And that might be a, a designer saying that cause like the designer comes in and is like, this is not going to work. You've been banging your house set in the wall and this is, this is the problem right here. And you're like, oh my gosh, that is the problem. And it's really hard for analysts to see that sometimes. Or it's a politician saying, you know what? We're not doing that program anymore. You're done. You know, you get, we need you on this. You know, so it's either the program is stopped or that effort is stopped or you're, you're one of the best analysts and like you can't actually finish it. So it looks like lost work to you and you have to go revector. So that's, that's analysts. Uh, designers are... Uh, in general, they can be foolhardy if you let them be unconstrained, <laughs> right? Designers are your tinkerers and your people that, that want to try everything. And so they want to bite, you know, they want to take as much from the buffet as possible and try everything and really, really find out what the best stuff is and what's, what's the optimal solution. So there's another, it's not a analysis paralysis. It's like this, it's an infinite design loop. And you, you, run, you want to pair an analyst, analyst or designer together because, and, uh, and I, I would say it's uh, called paired programming. It's the same thing. It's paired engineering. Uh, it allows the design and analyst, like I talked about before, to feed off each other. And you don't get this kind of infinite solutions perspective. And you're like, when, is, when are we actually going to be done with this job? When are we actually going to be done with this program? When are we actually going to be done with this problem? And so designers have a lot of ideas, but you really need to pair designers with other people to have them focus, you know, on a few key and, and then knock them off quickly with really solid, you know, fundamental analysis, engineering, or testing. So that's designers, uh, politicians, um, and uh, being one myself, you know, politicians in and of themselves can't get anything done. Right. If you just had a group of politicians, they'll make a lot of rules and structure, but you're not going to see any hard work come to the floor. But they're necessary in terms of providing group cohesion. And also, uh, I would say I've seen politicians be the best at kind of sourcing new projects for a team or for themselves to distribute to other people within their network. And they're... Uh, definitely good I would say at looking at kind of really complex like I would say market situations or even even like um, I would say group dynamics situations and assessing you know what are the issues really at hand um, so that you can fix a roadblock and it could be uh, you have the wrong pairing of a group of people or it could be that you're tackling the wrong market right? Or you're using the wrong reference point in the market to make business decisions. So that's, that's kind of like the politician engineer. And, and you, you see some of those people rise up the ranks, you know, in a, in a corporation and, uh, and become leadership because at a, a C-suite level, right, you have to embody a lot of that politician side to be successful. And so that's what I've seen on the politician side. But again, if you have all politician engineers, nothing's ever going to be done. If they're just going to be a bunch of entrepreneurs, you know, 
setting up a company that will go nowhere. Um, and then the last one are, are the, the hustlers, the floor workers. This is a, this is kind of a core thing in engineering, you know, that, um, I would say it's different across the types of engineering, right? Across aerospace versus mechanical versus electrical versus chemical. Um, in aerospace engineering, the hustler is, is someone that is down there on the floor with the layup technicians really understanding how you lay up a carbon composite, right? Not just designing it or analyzing it, but really getting there and maybe putting some gloves on and doing a couple plies themselves. Or it, they're down there like going and working with the manufacturing engineer and choosing out, you know, core material and, and feeling it. So like uh, a hustler person might be a more kind of tactile and visual learner. And uh, again, if you're overly dominant in a team with a bunch of hustlers, you're, you're not going to, uh, you'll get a lot of small things done, but you won't get like the, the big things done. You know, the, you know, the, you'll, you'll get, you'll, your to-do list will be scratched off, but like, it's going to be hard for you to get to your test. You know, if you don't have the actual analysis that underpins the test, right? You can't fly blindly into that. So like you can't spend all your time on the floor building with the technicians or the manufacturing engineers or the integration engineers um, and, and gets a project completed. So that's, that's kind of the hustler side, but there, it's a very important kind of skill to recognize that you are. Uh, so that you don't get kind of distracted and caught in just all these micro kind of like tasks that could be done by other person or really you shouldn't be doing. You should be focusing on more of the big picture. So that's it on that, Vinay. Really good stuff. Uh, thank you, Chad, for sharing some of that. And now can you give some examples of lessons learned you learned through failures? And, you know, is it okay to fail when you go in and you're hired and you make mistakes? Is that okay? Is that, is that going to be viewed badly or will you get fired or what's going to happen next? And a lot of engineers do have that concern. So I'm just wanted to get your perspective on that. And I realize yeah, so that it, that depends from company to company, but it, top level view, you know, can you tell me more about how you view this? You know, it does depend on company to company. And so what I can do is, uh, you know, share my perspective from being in a, a big company like Honeywell and being at a, I would say like a, a research center that would be Aerospace Corporation where, where Vinay works. Uh, that's a federally funded research and development center. So I would say that's kind of uh, more akin to academia. And then being at a, a startup you know, run by a, a person or a, a funder, Richard Branson, who kind of embodies the, uh, you know, let's, let's do it attitude, uh, which is kind of unconstrained, right? And I look at like how I've evolved as an engineer over the course of my career, and I was really I, afraid of failure at first. I think I got a lot of that, I would say, taken out by just working in the automotive industry at first for the first year of my career and building and designing uh, new turbochargers and testing them and breaking them, right? So I think engineers need that failure. They need that kind of first, uh, oh man, I really messed that up. It could be a test you know, and you screwed up some sensor that's kind of high cost, you know, or it causes a delay, you know, or it causes, um, you know, uh, damage to your test article that you have to remake. You know, you, you need that kind of event to really um, give you perspective that failure is going to be expected you want to try to control your failures as much as possible in terms of bounding them. And I would say you also want to have very clear and open conversations with your uh, leadership 
and that could be your direct manager or that could be a, a team you know leader or that could even be uh, in my case you know would be my VP or CEO on where you're allowed to fail you know what failures are are um, ex not expected but could happen and that's kind of being very open about what your 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 concerns are or what are the risks that you identified so like that's that's a conversation right a constant conversation that you have to feed with your own content and get feedback on and that allows you room to go at the speed that you need to go at to meet your commitments while also identifying there are some clear areas where you could fail or the team could fail and so you know failures is a is also something that you will learn probably the most from and so for instance in the launch demo that we showed earlier right we had the engine shut down we have publicly stated you know what the issue was it was a hard hardware issue on the first stage engine that failure is helping us as a company mature just like you crashing your bike when you're in first grade learning to ride a bike or kindergarten or second grade or maybe as an adult and getting your first kind of road rash and and getting a sense of like where you went wrong and and managing you know balancing on a bike it's it's uh it's something that will hurt and in the moment um it can seem i would say very uh lasting but if anything those moments at least in my impression you know from my personal experience have provided me a lot of growth and that's helped me you know be a better analyst if i really messed up a boundary condition like i talked about earlier or it could be on the politician side in a team dynamic in terms of i really didn't uh read that person well i didn't spend enough time with that person understanding who they are and I, I and I and I paired them up for a paired programming, and it and it didn't really work out how I how I thought it would, right? And that that's a failure, uh, but it's something I can learn from, and then I can help out, you know, I can help dodge it the next time. And and that's a uh, in aerospace, it's um, it's really interesting, I think, because there's this huge focus on how expensive these systems are, and what the consequences are of a failure, a catastrophic one, or a you know a semi uh, emission crippling one, or emission ending one. But there's a lot of lower level failures that happen to get to that place where you have that high emission assurance and reliability, and that that that's not you know something that you can skip over. If you want to be really good at emission assurance, you're going to have to fail. The launch vehicle industry went through so much over you know decades and had you know two steps forward and one step back or two steps forward and three steps back you know and some decisions that were made that were based on a politician side or a, a hustling side or a an analyst side or a designer right that happens so you just got to be ready for it and you know, dust yourself off and, and march forward, you collect your team, march forward. Very, very nice, uh, Chad. You know, I want to open it to the floor to see if there's any questions for Chad Foster. Hi, I have a question. Um, first of all, thank you so much for coming to class. Um, I guess in your role currently now at Virgin Orbit, what do you think is a, a more um, nascent or um, a phase of a, a stage of technology that's in its early phase that you're trying to um, flush out for future flight vehicles? So I can't go into the details too much, but I would say in general, something the industry has uh, been working on for a while and still working on, uh, and you see it and uh, um, some other of our, our competitors like uh, Relativity is the, the 3D printing of metallics. And there's a couple different ways to 
to do it. And there's a couple different ways to uh, approach it from a process control perspective or a training perspective or a, um, you know, an individual machine perspective. Like this machine is rated to do this with this person and that's it. And that's how you control it. So I think like the industry is still figuring a lot of that stuff out. There's some of the components that are finding their ways on, you know, to vehicles, you know, across the spectrum. And that could be on the satellite side and on rocket side. Uh, there's, there's still, I would say, a fair amount of work to go on that. Uh, and it's something I think that will open up um, some avenues for, for us as a company. And uh, they've already opened up avenues, you know, for other companies like uh, one of our other competitors, Rocket Labs. You know, they, they 3D print uh, a lot of their engine components. And so that, that's something I think across the industry that everybody's working towards, you know, and that it will help with cost, it'll help with rate, uh, but you just, you have to be very careful on, you know, the process controls and your post, uh, you know, your inspections, basically one of those legs of the stool that we talked about before. Anybody else? Any questions for Chad? Are you guys sure? Uh, could I ask another question, if it's okay? Sure. Please. Um, within the, the kind of new space sphere between like VO and Relativity and Rocket Lab, um, and, and, and places all over the, the country. How much um, cross-pollination between um, companies and startups um, and maybe with old space uh, is there? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think if you did some LinkedIn sleuthing, you could probably you know find out there there is a fair amount of cross-pollination. I would say the aerospace industry is is a small group of people, you know, within the United States and especially on the West Coast itself, right? We have a lot of uh, uh, legacy programs that have been here uh, that have been run out of uh, Southern California and or Northern California uh, for some spacecraft programs uh, combined with a lot of the spacecraft stuff you see in Arizona and uh, Colorado uh, and even some launch vehicle related activities as well. So there, there's a, there's a lot of that within the industry. I would say, uh, for Virgin itself, you know, a lot of the kind of original people here uh, came from SpaceX. Um, if you look at some of the old uh, makeup of the engineering organization, um, especially when I started 2015, and uh, since then, though, it's been, it's been really uh, kind of a mixture here, and we've got people that have uh, 30 plus years of experience. We have people that are fresh out of college, you know, that were our interns the previous summer. And so uh, that, that's, uh, that's healthy, right? There's, there's a lot of to be gained at both ends of the spectrum and there's a lot to be shared. And that's another part of the diversity of teams is the diversity of experience provides perspective. Um, one of the other things that I think uh, has been interesting is some of the other programs that have uh, ended, you know, within the time scale of a lot of these startups starting like this, for instance, C-17 program, you see a lot of people there that have the manufacturing know-how and kind of the production know-how populating a couple of uh, you know, these different startups, uh, especially the new space startups. And it's, it's been interesting. I, I think also the, the co-location of a lot of space startups in Long Beach has been helping that, you know, so it's not like you're uh, jumping, you know, across the country or to another town within the LA basin or to San Diego or to San Francisco. You're literally just starting a new job across the street. And so, you know, relativity is a stone throw away, throw away from us. So is Rocket Labs. So is another uh, launch startup, Spin Launch. Um, you know, that's, the, that's been interesting to see. We've been here for 
the longest uh, Virgin has. We started out as Virgin Galactic and then we spun off and became Virgin Orbit. So uh, it's been cool to kind of see the other competitors come to roost in the same area. It's similar to what uh, we is up at Space Park, right? You have a lot of, I would say competing, but also complementary complementary organizations. You have Boeing, you have Raytheon, you have uh, Northrop, uh, previously TRW, you have Aerospace Corporation, some of the other um, smaller companies as well, Millennium Space Systems, right? So I think these pockets of aerospace really help, you know, seed that uh, uh, cross-pollination that happens within a small community that we are. Anybody else? Um, I have a kind of random question, but um, what are your opinions on lighter than air vehicles, like airships? I know some companies are still coming out with those. So that would be for uh, applications like internet or visual um or anything like you're talking about uh, like the laloon i think it's the yeah, loon. there's loon and then there's also like a company called lta that's trying to make an airship i think it's very i think it's very interesting it's a it's ambitious um there could be a, a niche for those you know just like there 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 probably is a long-term niche for high altitude high aspect ratio electric uh solar uavs right those are that's another thing as the battery tech gets better you know and they move to uh like lithium i think it's lithium sulfur batteries or something you know with different chemistry uh that's really being driven by a variety of markets but one is the electric vehicle market you know there could be there could be a uh a market for these i would say um they're kind of like satellites, right? Uh, they they will have an orbit. They might follow the air currents, and but they could stay up in perpetuity and land only when they need servicing. So, yeah, I mean that could be an interesting uh, part of the picture. I would say of the kind of space surveillance or space uh, data stream coming from that those platforms. I just think that there's a lot of kind of uh, go with what you know, you know, with satellites and and Leo especially is is a great place to 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 be because um, you can kind of once you put it up, you know, it should be like an autonomous robot, right? It's going to do its thing or it's not going to do its thing. There there is like a uh, there is an aspect of like having a reusable component that makes it that much harder. I mean, we have that on our system, right? We have a reusable 747, right? That comes with a lot of different things than a uh, launch pad that you lease at Vandenberg or Florida, right? You have a maintenance schedule there, just like you have for your Honda, and you have to follow it to keep it certified and on the road and pay your registration. And it would be the same thing for these other types of craft that have to circumnavigate the globe, provide coverage or loiter, and still go through, you know, um, refer periods and landing and all that stuff. So it's, it's interesting. I mean, I, I just not sure how, how big of a market is there. And if it's really that cost advantageous to do that versus a small satellite up in Leo. Cool, thanks. Anybody else? Uh, I, yeah, actually, I mean, because I don't know if you guys know, but today was the career fair and so was yesterday. So I mean, as a senior, you, know, you got to start looking to the future in terms of like the industry that you want to go into. Uh, obviously, I mean, your whole life you've stuck to the aerospace industry and like totally killing it. It sounds so awesome. Uh, were there any other industries that you were looking at um, in terms of like the workforce? Yeah, so I, I really actually, uh, I was looking at auto 
automotive for a long time. And my first job was in automotive, oddly enough. Oh, cool. Uh, I, I do think there's a lot to be done there. And uh, initially, like way back when, you know, it, I was, you know, thinking, you know, fuel cell vehicles. And I think those are now kind of finally coming around. Uh, and we'll see if that's the final state or if the electric vehicle is the final state uh, for that kind of personal transportation mode. Um, so, yeah, I, I've looked at that. I, I will say also something that's really, I would say, interesting to me is uh, naval engineering, you know, for ships and submarines. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's really cool because it's very similar, I think, to the future engineering that we'll need on spacecraft. You know, having a, a fleet in space is going to be very similar to having a fleet in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, right? You're just uh, the time scale of, well, it, I mean, you can get someplace pretty quickly, actually, maybe quicker in space in LEO. So I... I think um, hello. Hey, oh, Trent. I, I, I uh, accidentally muted myself there. Uh, <laughs> so I think the naval engineering is is very interesting, Spe specifically like subs. That's a uh, very unique and has its mm -hmm. own issues and is going to be really useful down the road. Oh, I'm sure. I mean, like, if you think about like, like the Navy and the military technology, like even back when they were fighting in like World War One and whatnot, like it was so analog and like some of the stuff that it was so crazy. But, and even today, like the technology is still, although it is very advanced, there's so much room, I think, to grow there. I think you're right. Like all that stuff has like, you know, a lot of potential. It's like a really interesting. Like, yeah, so I mean, it's, it's like, I think also something really cool is like, I know it's kind of weird, but like cruise ships is really cool uh, because they're kind of self-contained cities and, you know, similar to an aircraft carrier or something. Uh, that whole, that whole thing will be helpful for like space station, larger space stations down the road. So I know that I'm going back to space, but I really do love space. I've loved it since I was a kid. And I, I think that's why I love some of these other industries and, you know, getting some experience there down the road, maybe it happens, you know, who knows, but I think it'll only help, you know, what we'll eventually do up in orbit, you know, long-term with a, with a human species. So I want to go ahead and thank Chad Foster for helping us think about what does it take to be a successful engineer? What are those key ingredients that need to be thought of in the design analyses and inspection processes and furthermore looking at areas where we can improve as engineers and working also with other team members in a successful way.